Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this session. So, uh, so in my talk, uh, I just want to uh, give a very brief overview of uh, post-COVID-19 era and IT. Okay. So, I mean, uh, uh, as we know, I mean, we have this uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak uh, around last year, November, right? And then now it is impacting all over the world and all our daily life and school life, I mean, research life, I mean, they are all affected by this uh, COVID-19, right? So because of that, I mean, everyone here, we are wearing masks and then we are also conducting our lectures and this conference uh, uh, virtually, right? And then we, we are also relying on like a network, right, so that we can still be uh, still be connected with others right so so I mean overall we can say that I mean this uh, COVID-19 is actually impacting uh, the world uh, very significant then uh, but what about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, information uh, technology so is it uh, we, I cannot say that COVID-19 is good or bad but I mean in terms of uh, IT companies uh, like a business, actually they are, uh, they, I mean, they are really benefited, right? So this is just one uh, news article uh, from Guardi uh, Guardian. So you can see that, uh, I mean, all the major IT companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook, actually uh, their um, shares uh, soared, especially during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, right? Uh, it's not because they are doing a very great business is mainly because of the situation itself, right? And I believe uh, many of you uh, watch it, like, uh, I mean, uh, YouTube or Netflix, right? So actually before COVID-19, I've never seen movie through Netflix, frankly. Mm -hmm. yeah, but during uh, this, uh, I mean, circuit breaker, I mean, I also tried this Netflix for the first time in my life. So I believe, I mean, many people in the world, I think, uh, they are using this kind of entertainment, uh, I mean, program so that they can be still uh, connected and they can still enjoy their life, right, through this uh, IT technology. And then when we talk about connectivity, uh, we can, we cannot, uh, I mean, we cannot miss like a communication technology. So many people are talking about 5G as the next generation uh, communication standard for connectivity, right? Yeah. Because I mean, we, we started from 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and then now we are talking about 5G, right? Then what is so special about 5G compared to the previous uh, telecommunication uh, standard? Uh, it's because when we talk about 5G, it's more for connectivity, okay? Uh, for example, uh, this diagram is showing the evolution of telecommunication, wireless communication. So I don't know, I mean, how many of you are starting from 1G? I, I can see a few, a few professors may experience the 1G here, but anyway, so when we started like a 1G, I mean, it, it was for analog telecommunication, right? And then, uh, around 1990 uh, when we had 2G we could start to text messages right and then as the communication technology evolves uh, we can uh, we can uh, use internet and then we can watch uh, video clips and we can send and receive data wirelessly right through this communication network right so I mean those are the benefits that we have enjoyed from 1G to 4G yeah. But in 5G, actually, it's, it's much more than uh, it's much more than 4G. For example, in 4G, pretty much of the I mean, uh, communication that uh, we are using is, is mainly for talking or, or like, uh, using internet, watching movies, right, or watching some like online. Uh, video clips or something like that, right? But when you talk about 5G, uh, it is much more than that, okay? So as you can see from this right diagram, uh, in 5G, we are actually claiming that 
uh, we can realize many of these uh, uh, new connectivity. For example, smart home, and we can also implement smart business, smart cities, uh, smart uh, transportation, smart grid, and smart healthcare. Okay? So they are, I mean, some of them are already here, but many of them are not here yet. But we are dreaming of realizing all this smartness, which is uh, facilitated by the realization of 5G. Okay? And one um, common word that you can find here is actually this smart. Okay? So what's the meaning of smart? Right? Because uh, when we talk about this smart, uh, I mean, de depending on the area that we are working on, the definition can be slightly dis different. But in general, uh, when we uh, talk about this uh, smart, usually it means uh, artificial intelligence. Right? Uh, I think many of you know this event, right? This uh, AlphaGo uh, and Mr. Seto Lee, so they played a uh, Go game, which is quite uh, popular in Asian countries. So, so I mean, I also watched this event, and then I, I mean, I myself also expected that the AlphaGo may, I mean, might still not be so good, I mean, enough to win the game, right, against uh, Mr. Seldor Lee. But it turns out that, I mean, the AlphaGo was much better than, I mean, human brain, right? So it was a very shocking event. And then after this one, especially in Korea, a lot of research efforts, uh, I mean, moved to AI, right? So many, many people joke that, I mean, if you want to get some funding from government, uh, if you don't include AI in your proposal title, I mean, you cannot get any funding, right? So there was some sort of joking that we had at the time. Okay, but uh, the, what is this AI? I mean, it's very uh, complicated to explain within a short time. But in general, we can say that uh, artificial intelligence uh, is doing some computation still, but in a very different way uh, compared to what we have done uh, previously in the conventional computing. Okay? So this diagram is just showing uh, an example of the deep neural network. So neural network is something that is commonly employed in realizing artificial intelligence. Okay, so then, then how uh, artificial intelligence can be useful, right? So you can see, uh, are they dogs or wolves? I actually mix them. Because can you recognize, I mean, which of these are uh, dogs and which of these are wolves? It's really difficult, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, even I myself cannot really recognize, even though I uh, put these uh, pictures in this slide. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, the D three they are wolves, and the rest one, two, three, four, uh, they are wolf dogs. Basically, they are dogs. Okay. And I gave you these answers, and can you define? Can you I mean come up with a very clear uh, explanation or mathematical models that can uh, differentiate? how these three are wolves and how these four are dogs. It's really, really difficult, right? I mean, if you can come up with those uh, algorithms or some sort of mathematical model, uh, they can differentiate uh, the differences between uh, wolf and dogs, then, uh, I mean, they can be a very good algorithm and then you can use it uh, as, I mean, uh, you can replace AI okay, for that application. But the thing is, it is I mean, extremely difficult and no one has uh, developed that kind of algorithm, especially in this image recognition, speech recognition, uh, object detection area. So because of that, uh, we cannot rely on a conventional like an algorithm based or mathematical expression based implementation anymore. So that's why this uh, artificial intelligence uh, has attracted uh, so much uh, so much interest from uh, research society, and then many people are working on it. And uh, this is just one example. Okay, so yeah, we can also use uh, AI for speech recognition and other others. Yeah, but 
in case that you can come up with a very clear mathematical expression and uh, I mean you can quantify the algorithm then you you don't really need AI okay then yeah as I explained I mean in some areas uh, uh, AI can be very very efficient and powerful but the question is uh, to realize smartness in our society uh, can we have this alpago like AI uh, everywhere? Yes or no? So uh, this picture shows uh, it shows the uh, alpago server racks. So as you can see, it's huge, but it's really bulky and huge, and it is connecting a lot of uh, I mean, uh, GPUs and memories, right? I mean, so that you can actually play uh, this go game with. Mr. Lee, okay. But when you talk about the hardware performance of this AlphaGo, uh, as you can see here, uh, this AlphaGo is consuming one megawatt. Okay, just to play one Go game with Mr. Lee, I mean, you have to consume one megawatt power. Okay, while Mr. Lee, I mean, as a human, uh, he on average he consumed about 20 watts. So this AlphaGo system is actually consuming uh, uh, 50,000 times more power, right, compared to human. Right? Then we need to uh, we need to think: Do we really have to have this kind of AI everywhere, or we have to use AI selectively? Right? Especially this kind of powerful AI. Uh, I mean, personally, I think it's a little bit difficult to employ this everywhere. But when you need, when you need to generate, I mean, very impactful results or outcome, I think we can employ uh, AlphaGo-like uh, high-performance AI. Yeah. So what is the recent trend in uh, AI, especially uh, in hardware? So uh, AI has been uh, developed uh, traditionally in software side. Okay, so as uh, Dr. Yu uh, is working on, I mean, software-based AI. I mean, uh, software area has tried uh, has driven this AI revolution over the last uh, few decades. And then uh, in those area, uh, face recognition, speech recognition, image and object detection. I mean, those are the main um, target applications that people try to use okay, uh, for AI. But the thing is, uh, as I just explained in the previous page, uh, software-based AI is actually run on some sort of uh, supercomputers or some dedicated uh, powerful AI system which consumes huge amount of power. Right? So that is the bottom line. But, uh, but these days, uh, due to the uh, development of 5G, which can connect so many devices, like billions of devices that, uh, can be connected. So in that case, it's, it's almost impossible for us to send all the data uh, generated by all the connected devices to the central AI server, and then ask the AI server to compute. Right, that's very, very inefficient in many different ways. So, so in our uh, electrical engineering, we are trying to actually distribute the AI uh, computation from the server to edge. So we call it edge computing. Meaning uh, in 5G or in, in our uh, future smart society, almost all electronic devices and sensors, uh, they can be connected because of the extremely high data rate uh, provided by 5G. And then uh, instead of just doing AI in, in the server, actually each device can have tiny AI engine. Okay? Because for example, if you are using a laptop, then you can have a little bit more computing power, then you can have a little bit uh, powerful AI engine in your laptop. But if you are uh, using uh, wearing a smartwatch, then the amount of data that I mean you need to process smartly using your smartwatch may be 
I mean, maybe less than the computing power that you have to do using a laptop or a server, right? So in that case, we can optimize our AI engine so that it can fit in this uh, smartwatch platform, okay? So, so there are many, I mean, different devices. So we can actually design compact, uh, we call it tiny AI. So we can develop tiny AI so that each devices can actually do uh, some AI computation and realize some level of smartness. Of course, I mean, by realizing this edge, com uh, smart edge computing, we can decide uh, many of the, uh, we can make this uh, decision locally and then we don't need to send all the raw or very critical data to the server. So it can, so we can have less communication and then it can be more secure, right? You don't need to send your, I mean, folder to the server and you don't need to send your like ID number to the server for AI computation. And then it can also consume quite less power and much more power and energy efficient, efficient overall. Then we can uh, spread AI almost everywhere, okay? Through uh, 5G-based uh, connections. Okay, uh, this one is, looks a little bit uh, difficult to understand, but uh, to realize AI, actually we usually rely on uh, some sort of hardware architectures that are called neural networks. But if you really look at uh, what is really happening in neural network, uh, there are a couple of operations that are extremely uh, frequently executed. Okay, And then uh, we found out that multiplication and accumulation function. Uh, well, of course, there are also um, other operations, but multiplication and accumulation, this is not a very complicated uh, operation, but this one is happening so frequently. But the problem is when you do multiplication and accumulation, you have to send data and you have to read data from memory. So that actually consumes a lot of power and uh, limit the performance of the AI that you are uh, implementing in hardware. So many people try to uh, make this operation very, very power and energy efficient. Okay, so then how can we, I mean, handle that uh, power and energy bottleneck? Uh, is, Currently, it's caused by the hardware architecture that we are using. Uh, I think many of you are using laptop now, but when you open your laptop, I mean, you also have this kind of system. So you have CPU, right? And then inside of your CPU, uh, you have uh, like a, a computing unit and register file and cache, okay? Based uh, using s -Fan, okay? And then uh, everything is integrated within a CPU. And after that, you also have DRAMs, right? So if you need more DRAM, I mean, you can open your laptop or PC and then you can add more DRAMs, right? So DRAMs can be used as second level memory. And even after this one, you can have what? Hard drive or SSD, right? Memory right? as second level uh, memory solution. But the problem is if you are using this very traditional hardware architecture for AI, then pretty much of the power and energy you are just consuming to uh, read and write data between CPU and memory, okay? So as you can see from this di uh, diagram, for example, if you, uh, I mean, uh, you are doing some computation which consumes only 0.1 picojoule per bit, but if you read data from DRAM, it is consuming one nanojoule. So how many times? 10,000 times, right? So here, I mean, for this operation, you are not doing any computation, but you are just reading data because you, you need to do some computa AI computation. So that data movement alone is already consuming 10,000 more energy compared to the computation itself. So how to make this value suppressed and close to this compu I mean, computation 
uh, power and energy. I mean, that is the real uh, bottleneck in terms of hardware these days. And if you can make it happen, then I think the, the software-based software AI can be easily migrated into hardware, and then we can uh, have much more powerful um, AI engines okay? yeah, on the market too. So at the moment, uh, there are several companies that are working on, uh, on this area. So they are trying to change the traditional computing architecture, and then they come up with uh, very specific hardware, uh, which is called uh, GPU or some company, uh, they are also developing um, application specific chips that can, uh, that can be used for dedicated uh, AI uh, operation. Okay. But uh, these uh, two solutions, they are still uh, mainly for very high performance AI, like uh, what uh, Dr. I mean, you is working on these days. But as I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, we are also trying to implement AI in edge devices tiny AI. So for that, uh, we have to come up with a very, a very compact uh, form factor with I mean, tiny AI capability. So this is just one simple uh, silicon chip that uh, I mean, our group developed. It is, on, uh, it is mainly for human gesture recognition. So we can actually process uh, the image data captured from a camera. And then this AI engine can actually recognize uh, human gestures. Okay, whether you are like a moving from left to right, up, down, diagonally, or, you, or, or whether you are doing some weird, okay, a dancing or whatever. Okay, so they can be uh, detected without consuming too much power. Okay, when you come up with a very uh, smart, uh, tiny AI uh, solution. So, Okay, this is just uh, some test result. So as you can see, uh, I mean, this chip is just consuming uh, 184 microwatt. Yeah, I mean, compared to AlphaGo, of course, I mean, this AI is a very tiny one, so I cannot compare this one with AlphaGo. But for gesture recognition, you don't need AlphaGo. You can still use AlphaGo for gesture recognition, but I mean, we can do the same function only by consuming 184 microwatt. Why do we have to use one megawatt just for doing uh, this kind of uh, tiny uh, artificial intelligence? Okay, so if you can have uh, application specific optimized AI engine in hardware, I think they can spread AI uh, to our society, uh, I mean, more easily and yeah, effectively. Okay, so this is a table. So let me summarize. Uh, I mean, COVID is affecting our society a lot, but we are still uh, want to be connected. And then uh, this will be accelerated after uh, COVID-19, uh, mainly through uh, information technology. And our next um, telecommunication standard will be 5G. And 5G is much more than just telecommunication itself. So we are targeting to integrate, uh, targeting to connect like a billions of devices together so that uh, we can realize like a smart world and uh, smart societies. And of course, when you talk about smart, that means artificial intelligence, but uh, we cannot, use current software intensive artificial intelligence in so many places, mainly because of the power. And then the hardware performance is still quite limited. Yeah, but if we can come up with very optimized hardware solution for uh, efficient, energy efficient, like a tiny artificial intelligence, then we can spread AI to all the edge devices, and then we can um, realize like a fully interconnected world with smart things. Okay, so that, that's my talk. Okay, so thank you for your attention.